One, I'm Neftali Williams, and I'm very excited to be with you all today because I think being here with the LA84 Foundation Summit represents a milestone in the changing way in which sports um, is being available to young people. Um, as you heard, I am getting my PhD in skateboarding culture, and I lecture at the University of Southern California right down the street for the Trojans that are, Trojans that are in the building. Um, and my focus has been looking at skateboarding culture and how do we use it as a tool for diplomacy um, and how do we store gear, excuse me, how do we drive kids into academia? Now this panel in particular um, is made up of some of the new sports that are going to be in the Olympics in 2020. Can we please get a, a little round of applause for Olympics 2020? Um, with these new sports having their addition during 2020, we hope that that will also make its way home to the games in 2028, um, and that LA will also be focused on making sure that there is access, to ev access for everyone. This concept of play for all is something that really means a lot to everyone that's on this panel. There were a few claps, but what that let me know was that there wasn't a whole room full of applause, and that meant that maybe people didn't know how these new sports are providing um, a, a wonderful way for our young, our young people to be engaged in a sporting activity, and that maybe they don't have the same access to resources that traditional sports have. So it's very important for us to be here, and we're really excited to be advocates for both our community, but more importantly, to be advocates for the children here in Los Angeles and in, uh, in the greater region, and for me in particular, as an envoy for skateboarding culture all over the world, um, all of those kids need someone to say, these are the sports and activities that we're involved in, and I wish someone would care about us who, is, who has some power. So I'm really honored to work with our panel today. Um, <laughs> and again, thanks to LA84 for putting us on the stage and let us, letting us have the opportunity to have the same power and the same voices as, as, um, as other sports. So today I will start from left. We have to my left is Vinicius Tinoco, who representing skateboarding culture. Uh, Maricela Rosales representing rock climbing, um, and Dave Proden representing surfing. So if you get, if you don't mind, could you just tell me a little bit about yourself and your work? And we'll start with Dave. Yep. Thank you. Um, my name is Dave Prodan. I work for the World Surf League. Uh, we've been crowning world champions since 1976. Uh, run 180 events around the world every year. Uh, I've been there for 12 years, uh, so my recent position is heading up brand. I worked in communications before that. Um, so it's a really interesting panel for us. I think we talked a little bit about the other day. You know, we're fortunate that we, we have sort of a venue in the ocean that it really doesn't care where you come from or the color of your skin or which gods you worship, who you go to bed with. So it is truly sort of a level playing field and, and very, very accessible and welcoming to everyone that tries it. Um, so yeah, so we really, as an organization, try to take our, our lead from that and we, we feel that surfing's for everyone. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Maricela Rosales. I am an ambassador for a rock climbing brand called Mad Rock Climbing here in Southern California. I'm also the um, Los Angeles coordinator for Latino Outdoors. We work with um, underserved communities on a national basis. We're unique because we're uh, volunteer led. And what we do is we work with underserved communities, um, whether it's taking them outdoors, educating them about outdoor recreation, resources that they can obtain to, th to make things more inclusive and diversify the outdoor space. I focus on rock climbing, mountaineering, hiking, and other sports that are very close to my heart. And um, one of the things that is important with the 2020 Olympics and climbing is that it's going to expand the way that climbing is seen on a national scale. And that's really important because uh, youth teams are growing and we need to diversify those spaces for underserved communities as well because that sport is an all-around sport that anyone can do at any age, at any time, anywhere. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm honored to be here. I'd like to thank the LA84 Foundation for the invite. I'd like to thank Naftali for representing us. And... Um, how many skaters do we have in the audience? Okay. Have a few? That's cool. Mm -hmm. Next year, we hope to have more. Mm -hmm. That's right. 
So my name is Vinicius Chinoco. I'm also known as Vina. I am the founder and executive director of Next Up Foundation. Our mission is uh, through skateboarding, art and education, break the cycle of illiteracy, drug use, and gang involvement among Anaheim youth. Once we are more prepared and well-established in Anaheim, our uh, business model is a, a model to go everywhere across the country, and uh, that's what we plan. Um, I was born and raised in Brazil, started skateboarding when I was 12 and uh, never quit. Um, one of my biggest frustrations is not being a professional skater, however, I understood that I could be involved in the skate industry and uh, in addition to our mission, uh, we definitely want to expose our kids to all the different roles that exist in the skate industry. So. Uh, we bring professionals from the industry and then they talk about their specific jobs and um, we try to, you know, give the ki our kids the chance to see that they can be involved with the skateboarding besides just being a professional skater. There's a, a lot more out there to, for them to explore um, and that's what we try to do. It's been a, a fun journey. It's my passion, it's what I do. Uh, I think that's why, why I'm here, that's my call. Uh, we started uh, back in 2010 uh, with the Boys and Girls Club. We made a partnership with the Boys and Girls Club of Anaheim and then uh, in 2012 we, uh, we expanded to Santa Ana. 2015, we ex 2014 we expanded to Long Beach. So at some point in 2015 we had three programs that were serving uh, over 12,000 kids along these years, and um, we plan on not stopping. And uh, I don't know if uh, I should uh, uh, keep going. I'd like to share a little bit of my background, or do I wait? You, well, your... I was I was going to ask that, so you can go yeah. ahead and do that. Yeah, because there is something special special about your background or in this I, space. Or should I wait? I can't no, wait. you can go. That's can I go? <laughs> <laughs> I'll pull I'll pull you off in a minute. But... All right, cool. Okay. Sorry. Well, uh, my story is a little bit different, and um, I was born and raised in Brazil again, and then um, started skating when I was 12. By the time I was 23, uh, I was engaged in competitions, I had the sponsors, uh, I was somewhat good, and um, a friend of mine invited me to join him in this skateboarding program inside of a juvenile hall. Uh, that was the foundation for the well-being of minors. Uh, their goal with that program was to help those teenagers, adolescents, understand that they made a big mistake in their lives and they lost their freedom. And uh, translating that into skateboarding uh, is, you know, we were all skate, we skate and then we take slams, we fall really hard. And if there's one lesson that we learn when we're skateboarding, is definitely deal with frustrations, with mental and physical pain, and learn how to get up. So our message was teaching them that they had the right to get up, and then once they were released from that place, they should go back to school, and uh, they should go back and try to find jobs, and uh, we were there to help them. Um, however, my dream was to come to California and experience ground zero for skateboarding. And uh, that's what I did. I came to California in 2006 when I was 24. Uh, I was thinking about starting something similar, but I was not sure if I wanted to go to a juvenile hall here for numerous reasons, and one of them because of the language barrier. I came to the US, I didn't speak a word in English. Uh, my very first day here, I was really hungry. I was in Hollywood. I, I, walked in, I was walking a sidewalk, going to a place where I could eat, and then I see Jack in the Box, and I'm like, all right, it looks good. <laughs> and then, uh, first person to say that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm right in the corner, ready to cross, and all the cars are stopping, waiting for me. I was like, what's going on? <laughs> and they're like, go, go. I'm like, all right, boom. Went there, I saw this big picture of a, a sandwich with a bacon, you know, and then I like bacon. I'm like, all right, number two, please. And the lady said, for here to go. I was like, number two, please. <laughs> And I think she noticed, you know, she's like, oh, for here, um, 
para, para acá o para llevar. In Spanish, oh, para acá, para acá. So, you know, English was definitely a big barrier, and um, I had to take my time. Took my time, uh, about three years, started feeling more comfortable with the English, and then um, uh, started the next step with the help of amazing friends. It was my vision, it was my uh, idea, and um, we started working with the Boys and Girls Clubs, and like I told you guys, we expanded from Anaheim to Santa Ana, Long Beach, and then uh, last year, uh, the city of Anaheim gave us so use of the a former Boys and Girls Club building. And this building is amazing. It's a 6,000 square foot building. building. It's adjacent to the public skate park. And it looks like the skate park belongs to us. And uh, we do have our own hours in the skate park. We also uh, have a little bit of challenge in sharing the park with uh, the public. Our, our, our goal is definitely to have our own building with our own skate park where there's no outside distractions and the kids can be more focused and then uh, we can uh, do what we do. And in this building uh, today, uh, we do some pretty cool things. We have math and English tutors. Uh, we have yoga classes. We have computer classes. We teach Microsoft Office skills. Uh, the kids get there at three o'clock. After they get off school from three to four, we have homework time with the help of tutors. From four to five, we skate every day. And then uh, Mondays and Fridays, we have computer classes. On Thursdays, we have yoga classes. Uh, on Tuesdays, we have workshops, different kinds of workshops, uh, art, uh, skateboarding, just related. Uh, we have a library full of skate magazines. Well, I, I want to pause you right there for one second. Sorry. One, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I, I just want us to be thinking in the audience about what he's saying about what's, what is available, right? This is one of the first of its kinds facility that's allowing the kids to also work on their homework, to be learning media skills, um, increasing their media literacy, um, and also feeling like they're part of the community. It's often people don't realize that it's very easy to disenfranchise our youth by putting sport in a box. Oh, we play soccer, or you play football, or you play basketball, or you do these things. But it's up to us as adults, as academics, as cultural institutions to recognize the special things that are going on with our kids when they're participating in things and not laugh it off or like, oh, that's just, you know, that's just a toy or that's just a game, it's not serious. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be smarter than they are. But what happens is they've already figured out these organic answers to solving their problems. Figuring out, huh, I need to get exercise. I need to build community. I need to feel like I belong to something. I guess I'm gonna participate in skating or surfing or rock climbing or any of the other sort of non-traditional sports. And I really wanna emphasize that having access to resources without us as adults making sure we're focused on encouraging and grabbing all of those kids, that means they're pushed out the entire time. He's talking about education and using that to channel into these action sports, but these are also the pathways that we can use to push them towards higher education and towards academia. Absolutely. So Vinicius Vin Vin was talking about the grassroots level. Can we talk a little bit about the grassroots level and your work in surfing and how you're engaged in that manner? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, surfing, not unlike skateboarding, it's one of the most accessible sports on the planet in terms of, you know, I, I could go to the U.S. Open of surfing and I can go out and surf with Kelly Slater before his actual heat. So we kind of laugh it off and say it'd be hard to make it to the forum and shoot hoops with Kobe before a game or something like that, right? So in terms of uh, accessibility, our surfers are incredibly communal and we like to work with different organizations around the world at these events where we are putting the world's best surfers with young kids, often disenfranchised kids, because you know, at the end of the day, the ocean's free. Um, you know, aside from getting a board, which we have sort of board donation programs or wetsuit or um, trunks, it just becomes an all-encompassing kind of lifestyle. And I think that's kind of what you see across a lot of these emerging sports is they almost transcend the definition of sport into lifestyle. We've been fortunate enough to have uh, a lot of sort of high-level executives come from outside the surfing world to our organization in recent years. And to a person, one of the observations is that, you know, what do the world's best surfers do on their day off? Well, they go surfing. You know, it's similar with skateboarding, it's similar with climbing, and 
that's just not something you find in other sports. So. Thank you very much. Uh, Marcella, can we talk a little bit about rock climbing space and what it is that drew you into that? Um, and maybe some, this will be for the entire panel, but what are some of the misconceptions about your sport? But can you tell us a little bit about what drew you into, to rock climbing and to being an advocate for young people in, the, in your space? I'm gonna try to make this as short as possible. So I'm from Los Angeles. I grew up with a disability. I wore a neck and back brace for about 18 years. I've always played sports, never good at anything, but always managed to be on a team. But something happened along the way. My dad used to hoard National Geographic magazines, and I would look at the cover, and I'd see mountaineers and rock climbers, and I wanted to be outside. I just didn't know how. I didn't know who to ask, and I didn't know where to go. So along the way, I went to UC Riverside. Wasn't a fan because it was the desert. I'm an inner city kid climbing on, in trees, buildings, very different concept of what it looked like for me. But someone introduced me to rock climbing, and that moment on, it was like the doors of, of heaven opened for me. No longer was I wearing a neck and back brace anymore. I was getting stronger mentally, physically, emotionally, and the community itself at my school transcended outside to a community that I can go with anywhere. And because of that, I was able to see that, you know, when I was going out, you would see a lot of privilege when you would go outdoors. You would see a lot of white men when you go outdoors. Slowly but surely, we're starting to see more women, more young women too, going into rock climbing. And it's amazing because there's this saying, we, we like to laugh about it, climb like a girl. And it's because you know women tend to have more of a technique when they're climbing, even when they are just starting. There's just like a natural tendency to want to climb things. And so um, when I started getting into climbing, my dad was like, no, it's para locos. It's crazy, and I was just like, mm, okay, I'm not gonna show you my photos, I'm not going to tell you where I'm going, but just know that I'm safe and I'm with good people and they're teaching me how to climb. And because I had that, um, that experience, it fostered a sense of uh, self-worth and dependent on myself and my community. So my dad told me, before he passed away, I took him to a rock climbing a store and he was like, oh wow, this is amazing. There's photos of women climbing, different types of rock climbing shoes and gear. And so I was educating him about it and I was, I was learning along the way. And he told me, he's like, mija, I know that you've, you've dealt with a lot of um, issues with your body physically and you're changing. And I want you to continue to do that, but don't forget about the community that needs this as well. And because my dad told me that and supported me, even though he was like, no, this is crazy. You know, you're gonna hurt yourself. Your back is already broken. Let's not continue that whole process. Um, he decided to you know, give me the blessing. And because of that, I somehow landed an amazing job with uh, Mad Rock Climbing. And uh, because of them, I, I go to gyms and I talk to people about rock climbing shoes and education. And I gravitate towards families and little kids. I'm like, hey, you know, try these shoes on. Or how about you try this and that? And the climbing community is the same way. If someone climbs on a professional level or someone's climbing at a beginner level, they come together. Even if they don't know each other, if, if someone's like struggling on a problem, that we call them problems, someone will come up to them and be like, hey, how about if you switch your hand and put your foot here and really engage yourself, you're gonna get it. And you, you hear people cheering them on, they're strangers. And because of that, it's, it's so moving that people tend to come back. So the climbing community when I started was small. And since I've been working with this brand and I've been working with the community, I'm starting to see these faces over and over again at different gyms now. Now I'm starting to see more families, more youth coming in, adults, elderly people coming into these rock climbing gyms and then taking that outside. And it's, it's so moving because that's, that's something that I want for all communities to see is that rock climbing is not just a sport for its athletics, but a sport that is communal and brings anyone in despite race, class, or gender or ability. It's amazing. I would say that tends to be sort of a common thread amongst the, the, the new sports that are, they're, they're still called emerging sports, but the truth is they're the sports that have always been going on that we're just sort of taking, taking more notice of. Um, you were mentioning the rock climbing community and it being communal. Um, I believe it's that same way in surf, would you, would you say that? Sure, yeah, I think there's probably an element of earned inclusion, right, um, where you put the time in, and, and there are barriers to entry. I mean, you, we are primary, we're exclusively, up until recently, uh, a coastal exercise. You know, with the advent of uh, Kelly Slater's wave technology and probably the worst kept secret in surfing in September, we ran an event. Um, it really does open up a lot of doors for spectators and 
uh, participants in the sport where we can deliver that feeling that you get in the ocean, um, even a fraction of it, to anyone, anywhere, at any time. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's definitely a close-knit bond across people that kind of seek that inclusion out. Uh, Vinicius, so can you just tell us a little bit about the skateboarding culture, uh, the size of skateboarding culture in Sao Paulo? Because you came all the way here, that's what they heard, that you came to be at the nucleus, you know, ground zero for, for skateboarding culture. But last I checked, Brazil was uh, pretty much the hotbed of new talent for, for um, skateboarding. Yeah, skateboarding, uh, <clears throat> skateboarding in Brazil, I think uh, right now is the second most popular sport just behind soccer. Let that soak in for a second. <laughs> <laughs> second most practiced sport. There's a lot of data actually that's been talking about that. So I'm not sure. Just a show of hands, we knew that there were some skateboarders in the room, right? Yeah. Can you show your hands again, those who, who, who are skaters? Okay, great. Can you put your hand down? For those of you who know someone or is a relative of someone who rides a skateboard or is it, there's a skater in your neighborhood, can you raise your hand? Okay, so what does that mean? This entire room is filled with people who've seen someone skate or, or are close to someone who's riding skateboarding, but that's not been one of the focus, right? Action sports have not been in that, but it should be because you're all familiar with someone who does it. So just in that, and in this room, that's here right now. I've been in Sao Paulo, I've been in Brazil, I've done research in South Africa, Cuba, the Netherlands, this organic growth is the thing that we need to tap into, is what's going on, supporting our kids in, in their space. So, Venetia, so you come here and you decide that you're going to do a similar project. Did you have a lot of backing and support when you got started? Well, uh, I had a lot of uh, uh, desire to make something happen, uh, something big, because also, I come from a very low-income family, grew up in a very impoverished neighborhood. My parents could buy me a pair of shoes a year, you know. And, uh, but I've always wanted to talk big things and talk big travelings and travel the world and do something uh, meaningful. And um, skateboarding, really, when I started skating, you know, I started noticing this world and then I started feeling part of something. And then uh, skateboarding really took me from my on street right there where I used to live. It took me to different neighborhoods and then took me to downtown and uh, meeting new friends and then, you know, engaging in competitions and traveling to cities and then from cities traveling to different states and uh, just meeting more people, more and more people. and. Uh, uh, understanding that there were skateboarding uh, in different countries and here was the mecca for skateboarding and uh, watching all the 411 video magazines and all the skate videos made me really want to come here and uh, I didn't have any intention to become a professional skater here but I wanted to be here and be inserted in the, in the community and uh, because I had a passion for uh, underserved youth because I know uh, our kids, especially the underserved kids, the majority of times all they really need is just a little push in the right direction and they will succeed. And um, unfortunately because of uh, circumstances and I believe everyone here in this room agree with me, we are product of the environment that we live in. A lot of kids don't, don't succeed. They use their uh, ability uh, to do different things, you know, and those different things are usually things are not honest, things are not uh, uh, right. And um, I wanted to really uh, make a difference and help, you know, and then sort of fly the flag where I come from and then say, look, we're skateboarders. Uh, you know, there's this misconception of skateboarders being bad people, bad boys, and uh, no, it's not like that. We are fathers, we're husbands, we're business owners, we're dreamers. Young ladies. Exactly, and uh, we're here to, to help. We're here to make a difference, and uh, I think that's why everything came together. And then, really, I'm a big believer on the law of attraction, or you want to call it God or whatever. When you really want something, if you have absolutely no doubt, it happens. And uh, next up was just a vision. And today we are 
solid nonprofit organization, 6,000 square foot building with a solid curriculum. That's fantastic. Thank you. I'm in a class yeah, right now. <laughs> Now, you mentioned, you mentioned misconceptions, so I, I really would like to just talk to the panel and see what are the sort of misconceptions of, um, of your sport and how this audience could actually help you overcome all those things and how LA84 could help you with that. We'll start in the end with that. Yeah, I mean, the easiest one, sort of the fast times at Ridgemont High, Jeff Spicoli. <laughs> right, and everyone knows what that is, right? Sure. Everyone in the audience. So I just want to just think about that for one second. That's an image in the media that has stuck in everyone's mind. So that means that's how we're actually thinking about our kids. I know, I know people involved in all these sports who get yelled at by passerbyers or just in general saying, you're going to break your leg, you're going to hurt yourself, you're a bunch of stoners. For some reason, we've decided that a group of our kids are not worth talking to you, caring about, or treating like we should treat other children. So I'm glad that you actually brought that up because a, a, student, a student of mine actually made a meme that said skateboarding in academia in the 80s showing, showing the fast times in Richmond High and he showed the panel conference that we did at USC Annenberg last Monday which had some of the greatest minds in skateboarding and skateboarding culture along with the State Department um, and skateboarding demonstration to get us rethinking what it is our kids are participating in. So, Everyone knew about that negative image, and I'm glad that you can have that burned in your head to think about it the next time you see somebody sort of pushing it in that, in that direction. Yeah, so, for, sure. for sure. And I mean, I think, you know, today the surfing industry is a multi-billion dollar a year industry. We've been a sport for 40 years, and in 2014 we had our first South American world champion in Gabriel Medina. Um, Say and, it one yeah, more time. Sure. One more time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And, and I mean, the Brazilians have been a part of our culture for, for since the beginning. Um, but it wasn't really until sort of probably, I'd argue, the information age really leveled out access to good equipment, good training, good technique. Um, and once all things are leveled, which is really one of the more beautiful things about international sport and the Olympics, is that the point of difference becomes desire. And uh, Brazilians uh, then, as they do now, had an edge on the rest of the world when it came to desire, and it was really a beautiful thing. Um, and, and the payback in Brazil is that it became, it, it, it has been, but it, it is now firmly a national phenomenon. Like These surfers from Brazil that are on tour now actually have a hard time being there because they're celebrities and they get followed around a that lot. Is that and, is true. And when that it was happening, it was, it was uh, the World Cup year, and um, I remember Brazil suffered a pretty painful loss to uh, Germany, maybe, um, in the World Cup. <laughs> I assume bring up PTSD. Yeah, yeah. Forget that. Yeah. But, but it, it was interesting tracking the, the media and the market in South America at the time because you felt the country's heart being broken. And then they picked their heads up off the floor and saw this kid, 20 years old, beating Kelly Slater and Mick Fanning and the world's best surfers, and for the first time in their life, they had an opportunity to win a world title, and the entire country channeled their momentum into this kid. It's one of the most special things I've ever seen in my 12 years. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, Marcel, would you talk a little bit about the, the misconceptions and obstacles? From my own experience, when I tell folks that I'm a rock climber, the first thing is like, you rock climb? Why do you rock climb? That's so dangerous. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to break your back. And this is how we talk to why? people. Yeah. Yeah. Like why? literally with, with that type of expression, I'm like, it's actually really safe. You know, we calculate our risks. Um, another thing is that, you know, um, when they think about rock climbing, they think about like the truly extreme sports or movies, you know, where you see Sylvester Stallone or, um, you know, trying to do this like risky move or, you know, it, and it's nothing like that. It's really, um, you know, calculated. We have partners, you know, we train to do these things. Um, and we make it fun, you know, it's, it's an educational experience, it's obviously, obviously really challenging, but you know, uh, anyone can really do it, and I've seen it firsthand. I've seen um, folks that climb for the first time and they're in their 60s. I've seen kids that are two years old and they're climbing on the wall, you know, and it's, and a, and it's an amazing thing that, that people can do that, and it's because we're channeling a different mindset. We're not focused on what's going on around us, we're focused on how we can um, go to the next move and go to the next move while pay attention to our body and what it can do. Um, you know, some of the barriers that um, is going on right now on a national scale is a lot of the rock climbing gyms are really expensive. You know, if, if you, you know, are inner city family, 
and you want to go to a rock climbing gym for the first time, to go to a gym, it's maybe 20 to $35, one pass. Memberships, maybe 70 to $100 to go to these rock climbing facilities. Um, there's about 400 uh, climbing facilities in the US alone. Um, there's about 13 million rock climbers throughout the world. Uh, globally, it's uh, very appealing to a lot of people. But you know, another barrier is it's really expensive. Um, you know, there's different levels. There's bouldering, then there's sport climbing, then there's traditional climbing, then there's mountaineering, then there's alpinism. And on that scale, the most affordable is bouldering. And it's because you can go outside, have some rock climbing shoes, some chalk, and a crash pad, and you could go outside and go on a hike and find some boulders that are already uh, created through a guidebook. But you know, along the way, it gets really expensive. So that's a challenge. So people are like, no, 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 no I can't do that because it's really expensive, or you know, I can't afford it because you know, I have a family of four or a family of five. And so, you know, one of the things that Latino Outdoors does for the community is we work with rock climbing gyms so that on a weekend when, um, you know, we're able to gather the family together, we're able to educate them about the sport and then they can actually participate. And what, we're, what we want to do is we want to foster a sense of uh, excitement but also an, an educational experience so that they can go back by themselves and do it again or go as a family and do it again or, or join a team. But I think uh, an issue is that there isn't that many organizations working with rock climbing gyms to do these type of recreational sports because we're, we're only focused on basketball, football, and soccer when rock climbing should be included as well because it's, a, it's an all-around sport. There's more kids doing it. It's going to be in the 2020 Olympics, which is really exciting. And it's I'm going to clap one more time for that. <laughs> And what's so cool about um, rock climbing um, going to Tokyo is that we have a lot of these young professional rock climbers that are going to um, focus on three disciplines in order to win a medal is bouldering, sport climbing, and speed climbing. Usually climbers focus on one style of climbing, but this one is going to challenge them at th three different disciplines, which is really exciting to see um, some, like uh, Kai Leitner, who um, is a world-class climber. We have Ashima, uh, who is also a world-class climber, and she is the youngest female climber who has climbed something we call a V15, and nowhere has anyone else done that. Wow. So that's really impressive. We have Megan Mascarenas, who is a young adult, and she started in her youth, and she's just killing it in the World Cups and then national qualifiers, and it's just see, seeing these kids doing some amazing work, it's like people are, are changing their mindset, like, you know what, I mean, it doesn't seem so bad. Like, even if they're kind of doing this stuff, <laughs> doing this and contorting their bodies, it, it's, it, it's pretty impressive what the body can do, and people are changing the way that they see the sport. That's, that's amazing. Sorry, right. one more on that. <laughs> now, you were mentioning that bringing, um, the Olympics bringing in new light to the sport. Um, Vin, Vinicius, do you want to talk a little bit about um, skateboarding and skateboarding in the Olympics and, and what you see for that? Yeah, that's a... You can speak openly and honestly. <laughs> that's a delicate okay. subject, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, some of, uh, some of our community members are definitely against uh, skateboarding being in the Olympics, and I don't think this is, a, in, is new to you guys. I'm sure you guys are aware. Uh, I call those, uh, uh, maybe they call themselves core skateboarders and uh, they believe that skateboarding has its own culture, has its own uh, society, has its own industry and uh, we don't need to be in the Olympics to, to get any more recognition. Uh, I think skateboarding uh, has been growing and for along the years since when it started it. And I don't think it's gonna shrink. I think it's only gonna grow more and more. And uh, the Olympics, I think the Olympics will just make that a little bit easier because skateboarding will be televised to billions of people and uh, billions of people will have more access and uh, billions of kids will have more access and they will see skateboarding for their first time on television and they'll be like, I wanna do that. You know, it happened to us, right? right. I saw skateboarding. Uh, my friends were skating down the street. I was like, whoa, that's, that's cool. I want to <laughs> participate in that thing, you know? So I think uh, the Olympics will really um, uh, help the growth of the sport and uh, will definitely strengthen the industry. Uh, different companies will definitely 
be part of it. And I think also it's a time for us skateboarders to get organized and prepared and uh, well-educated and uh, really, you know, take place and say, look, this is our industry. That's how we run. You are now an outsider who's coming in. This is how we do. So watch it. Watch out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I understand. I, I totally understand. I think that skateboarding the Olympics will be really good um, as long as skateboarders are making sure that we're using it as a platform, just like we're all doing this right now, using it as a platform to educate people about the culture. Because as you heard from all of, all of our panelists, none of them were talking about competition being the most important aspect. And so those are the things that sort of cultures, newer cultures like us can be afraid of. But I think that that can go hand in hand with just simply educating people and letting them know that that's what's unique about our culture. And that's actually great because not every kid wants to compete, but every kid wants to play, right? Absolutely. Every yeah. kid wants to be involved somewhere. Thanks. Yeah, that's Thank right. You. Thank you. And I think uh, it goes. Uh, I think it goes uh, to surfing. Yeah, also, was just, right? he's really? doing the moderating right now. I just pulled it out from under me. I was just going to move it over. Sorry. But can we talk a little bit about that in surf in that space? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's probably similar for all three activities here. Where, um, again, similar to what we talked about before, it's something that transcends sport. Where these activities become an all-consuming kind of passion for participants. Um, and that seeps into people's personal identities. So the WSL, as the sporting expression of surfing, struggles with a similar issue, right? Where when one particular expression that isn't totally uh, in line with someone's personal identity um, is succeeding, there's blowback for sure. Or we're looking at the Olympics similar to how you described it, where if it's showcased in the correct light and we're celebrating the story of surfing and we're widening that aperture uh, beyond sport and talking about the history and the culture and the heritage and the lifestyle component, then it's a huge opportunity. Um, you know, candidly, our biggest concern is uh, the waves, uh, Chiba in the summer, real crapshoot. So if uh, there aren't any good waves, it's going to be a challenge. Um, but we'll work on that. No, that's, that's fantastic. That is one of the things people look and say, well, will the culture be intact? But as long as we're being adults and focused on telling the story and getting those messages out, those are the stories that are still going to inspire our kids and create the next generation and, and allow them to be engaged um, with, our, uh, with our activities. So lastly, I just wanted to wrap it up looking to the future and being part of LA84 um, and the Olymp Olympics coming. Is there something in particular that you would like to tell the audi audience about how they could support your work in your organization, be it be it coming to lunch, having flyers, whatever the case is, or actually really supporting us, taking some time to sit down with all those kids that you know who are riding skateboards that may be just passing by. So you can say, how, how could this audience help surf? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the WSL is fully in support of uh, pushing the trial option that we have in Tokyo to become an Olympic sport in perpetuity. Um, we'd love nothing more for that. We're based here in Santa Monica. We run events all over the world, but we're, we're open to partnering with organizations, working with kids, having our surfers come by and talk to them about surfing. And again, it, it, you know, for us, if we're, if we're impacting people that maybe they're not even going to swim, let alone surf at some point, then we're doing the right thing. I think surfing is something that transcends the actual activity. And if we can inspire people to have a better life, um, even if they never get in the water, then, then we've succeeded. And that's the goal. That's fantastic. Um, I think one, uh, one thing to do is to look for organizations that are already doing work with youth and outdoor recreation and possibly helping them create new programs for rock climbing itself. There isn't that many programs out there for rock climbing specifically, but that would be a great tool or a great suggestion and to put money behind that so that more folks can get into rock climbing. Um, similar to like uh, Brothers of Climbing, uh, we have Outward Bound Adventures, Outward Bound, and other organizations, or even like REI, if you've ever been to the store, they also work with communities and, and other sort of underserved communities as well for that Fantastic. reason. Yeah. Vin, you uh, got 30 seconds. My leg fell asleep. <laughs> 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 all right, well, your, well, time's, your right. time's burning. You got, got 30 seconds like to Like I say. said, we are, uh, we're a model to go everywhere. We're uh, planning to get well-established in Anaheim. We definitely need some financial support. The organization is... Neil, 
uh, it's a grassroots organization. If there's anyone out there interested in learning more, you can come up to me and ask any questions. I'll be happy to talk to you guys. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for coming today. And with our last 10 seconds, uh, this was a fantastic panel. We appreciate you all working with us today. And uh, thank you very much. Hey, uh, one, one last question. Is there anyone out there that can take a photo for us? So no, can that's excellent. We'll get it, we'll get it later. We'll get it later. We'll get it later. <laughs> Instagram. No, is it? Oh, we'll get it for the gram later. We can do that. Yeah. No problem. Can you? Yeah, come on.